the question was asked about remyelination and repair strategies, and, and um, we're going to go uh, at a pretty quick pace to get through a lot of material, uh, and uh, if there are questions, there'll be a question and answer session later on today that I'm happy to take. Um, the key word here, the key word in this title is remyelination. So what I am talking about is the wire number one, so all the strategies I'm going to be talking about are when wire number one is damaged, when its coating is damaged, and that's the myelin. So the blue line that's there is the wire, is the axon going down the spinal cord. The gold yellow is the myelin that wraps around it. It is produced by a cell called an oligodendrocyte. Say that five times fast. Oligodendrocyte, oligodendrocyte. So the oligodendrocyte sends out arms and makes this material called myelin, and it's just like the insulation around any wire or plug. So if, uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember stereo systems, the kids in the audience don't know what I'm talking about, uh, back in the day there was this thing called a stereo, and you had a stereo and you had a speaker and a speaker wire that connected it. That insulation around the speaker wire, that was the myelin. So what happens if you damage the insulation around the speaker wire? The music doesn't sound so good. It's staticky, it's noisy. Uh, if you move the wire a certain way, you might get funny sounds. Same thing if you move a certain way and you have demyelination, you might get lightning bolts down your back or down your arms. And so you can think of it just like the insulation. So the oligodendrocytes that make the myelin start off as little baby cells, and then they grow up into what are called oligoprecursor cells, and then they make oligodendrocytes, fully formed adult oligodendrocyte, and they start making myelin. And the myelin is what's in that outer part. So the inner butterfly, which is the gray matter, is essentially uh, not completely devoid, but significantly lacking myelin. Almost all the myelin in the spinal cord is around the outside, which is why when Dr. Kerr told me this is a demyelinating disease, demyelinating disease, he said it's wire number one that's getting affected. So we're going to talk about whether it's wire number one in the spinal cord or in the brain, the myelin that can be affected by acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or the myelin that can be affected by neuromyelitis optica in the optic nerve, or the myelin in the spinal cord that can be affected by any of these conditions, we're going to talk about the research to repair the damage that's been done. Where do we stand for repairing damage? So there are two strategies that are currently being pursued in science for repairing damage. The first strategy is a molecular-based promotion of repair. I give you a drug, a molecule, to get your body to repair the damage that's been done. Or I give you an antibody, a protein that attaches to cells within your body. So basically the theory here is you have everything you need to repair, we just need to turn it on and make it repair. The second uh, set of strategies called cell-based strategies, uh, you hear about stem cell therapy, so these are all stem cell strategies are where we say we are going to give you a new cell to go in and try and repair damage. Everybody see the difference between the two? So we're going to go one at a time through these, and I'm just going to give you the update in terms of where do we stand with each of these. So we're going to start with small molecules. Could you take a pill and get your body to start regrowing myelin? And there are a variety of strategies that are in the literature and some that have made it to human trials uh, to help repair. So it turns out that oligoprogenitor cells grow into oligodendrocytes, they make myelin, and at a certain point, your body tells them to stop because you don't want too much myelin. You want just enough. So we are engineered with a little thermostat in the neurons to say, nope, more, 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 more. Okay, I'm good, and the myelination stops. The problem is when you lose myelin, the stop signal doesn't go away. It's just still sitting there. So when cells go into the nervous system to try and repair, they start to do their job, and then they say, well, I see the stop signal, so why bother? So one of the strategies is, could we stop the inhibitory signal? Could we let your body finish off the repair job it's trying to do? And there's a drug that's been under uh, investigation, works in animals, that can actually stop that inhibition called benztropine, and some groups are looking at using it to try and enhance repair. And then there is trying to support those oligoprogenitor cells. Once we get a little older, and I won't give you an age cutoff, uh, do you want to know the definition of middle age? It's 15 years older than whatever you are right now. Um, <laughs> and I will say, uh, uh, Sandy, you'll appreciate this one. I was uh, rounding not that long ago, so 
everybody here is now familiar with the notion of rounds. These big teams of doctors and nurses walk in and you get us for 30 seconds and then we leave and you're in the room for another 23 hours waiting for us to come back. Uh, that's rounds. And on rounds, we have medical students who are learning how to do things and they'll often present to us. And I, I was listening to a medical student present. Mark, tell me what you would have done in this situation. He said, and I quote, this is a 50-year-old elderly male. <laughs> and I, I put up my hand and I said, I know at the beginning of this rotation we said you all start with an A. You start with an F. You're going to have to work your you-know-what off to try and get back up to a good grade because you are actually failing this rotation at that point. Anyway. So as we get older, the oligoprogenitor cells don't do as good a job differentiating into the oligodendrocytes to remake myelin. And there are several different molecules that can actually, in a dish, promote their maturation to a point where they make myelin. So this might be a good thing to do in humans. And there's three listed here. Uh, one's an antifungal, one's related to certain steroid molecules, and one's a vitamin called biotin a B vitamin called biotin. So all of these, uh, two of these have been tried in clinical trials or are being tried in clinical trials, so in humans to try and see can we measure that they actually promote repair. One of the big questions about all of these is when do you have to do it? Can you do, do you need to do it in the first 24 hours, 48 hours, week, two weeks? We don't know yet. In terms of is there a window of opportunity, we're trying to sort that out. So what about the antibodies? Those are examples of small molecules, but is there an antibody, which is normally a protein your immune system makes, but we can engineer kind of boutique antibodies to attach to cells and try and get those cells to take on certain functions. And there are two antibodies that have been in human trials to try and promote remyelination. Uh, one of them, uh, which is called antilingo, uh, has completed phase two studies in humans and is moving on to try and see if it can induce repair. These studies have been in individuals with optic neuritis and multiple sclerosis trying to uh, show that when we give this antibody, which helps the um, oligodendrocytes uh, complete myelination of an axon, uh, do we see improvement. The other molecule uh, it still goes by its, its uh, name from the lab, RIG-M22, recombinant human IgM22, uh, guess how many they tried before? 21. They got to 22, and it was looking good. So RIG-M22 has finished two phase one trials. We're waiting on the data from the second phase one trial. Uh, both of those trials were done in multiple sclerosis, but we fully expect and have been asking uh, the companies to consider transverse myelitis, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis as potential patient cohorts to consider in future studies, and those conversations are ongoing. So there are several options that are going on in the small molecule antibody world to promote repair. But when I get asked about repair, everybody focuses on stem cells, whether it's in Panama City or Russia or the guy behind the 7-Eleven uh, who's got a really cool van and says stem cells on it. Uh, everybody's interested in stem cells. And uh, what's really important about this is to recognize not all stem cells are created equally. The language around this really stinks and I would argue is incredibly misleading to you, the consumer, in terms of what we're talking about. So part of what I'm gonna explain are the four different types of stem cells that are commonly referred to, but nobody ever tells you what they're talking about. So one of the cells is using an oligoprogenitor cell or an embryonic derived stem cell. The other is called a mesenchymal stem cell. There is a stem cell transplant, which is a bone marrow transplant. And then there are what are called re, uh, reprogrammed, uh, induced, pluripotent stem cells. And when you're talking about the stem cells that you can get in uh, Mexico or Panama City or Russia or take a tourist trip somewhere, almost always it's either the mesenchymal stem cells or bone marrow stem cells. Those are the, the two that are being used off-label all over the world in different ways. So let's explain what these are. So mesenchymal stem cells are adult-derived cells that can turn into a lot of different things, but not everything. And they have been used in all sorts of fashions to treat uh, inflammatory conditions of the nervous system, multiple sclerosis, transverse myelitis, in boutique shops all across the world. Almost all of the data suggests that these cells are not inducing repair. So when we look in the animals, we don't see these cells regrowing myelin. What we see is they change the immune system 
in very significant ways. And so if your central nervous system was in a world with a lot of inflammation, these cells help dampen the inflammation and then your own body can repair what was already there, but we actually don't see these mesenchymal stem cells in a convincing fashion actually inducing repair. And it's worth noting that there have been several patients where they were injected with mesenchymal stem cells where it induced a new immune-mediated attack on the central nervous system. So we had some patients who were in a mesenchymal stem cell uh, trial where they got ADEM uh, because it activated the immune system in a way that we didn't. So th this isn't worked out and it isn't something that is ready for prime time yet. We would love to find a way to take these adult-derived cells, because we can get them from your tissues in lots of easy ways. So when you hear about, you go down to Mexico, have a little liposuction and a stem cell transplant, you know, we get the cells from fat. That's mesenchymal stem cells. We, we need to understand the control of them before they're ready for prime time. The other area of stem cell work uh, that gets classified as stem cell therapy is in the bone marrow world. And I, I think this is also a little bit of, um, uh, misrepresentation, because technically it is a stem cell trial, stem cell therapy, but it's the stem cells to repopulate your bone marrow, and, and the cells that we are using are specifically to repopulate a bone marrow, not necessarily to turn into a myelinating cell or an axon. So the bone marrow therapy is we take a person's bone marrow, we expand stem cells out of the bone marrow, and then we wipe out your entire immune system and we wipe out your whole bone marrow, and then we give you back your original bone marrow stem cells. And they go into your bone marrow, the long bones, they repopulate, and they start creating a new immune system. So for individuals who have autoimmune diseases where attacks keep happening, it's an interesting option. For individuals who've had a one-time only event, this likely isn't gonna lead to a restoration of function because the stem cell we're given is specifically trying to change the immune system and not necessarily trying to repair. So then we get to the third kind of stem cell, and this one is fascinating. This one has gotten, is responsible for, um, uh, as we'll read in a moment, Nobel Prizes, uh, but the idea was instead of having to take a fetally derived stem cell, could I take one of your cells and reprogram it back to be the earliest stem cell possible, earlier in lineage than bone marrow, earlier in lineage than the mesenchymal stem cells? And the answer is yes. So we can take skin cells, fibroblasts, we can take immune cells, take them to the lab, and if we induce changes in four genes, those cells will start to behave just like embryonic stem cells. And this work uh, led to the Nobel Prize um, in 2012, uh, shared between two groups. And there were four genes that were altered uh, in order to get those skin cells to turn into stem cells. Very exciting work. There's one big concern. These genes uh, are involved in cancer. So specifically the CMYC gene, when it's mutated, is commonly found in certain types of tumors. And so the question is, if I take your cell and I re-engineer it uh, to put into you to remyelinate, but then you develop a tumor later, did I do you a, a really big favor? Probably not. So they're working on a variety of ways to recreate the idea of taking an adult fibroblast cell, turning it into a stem cell without having to mutate tumor suppressor genes because that's the real risk. So we are not at the point of human trials yet for that. And it brings us to the last point, which is oligoprogenitor cells. So as a reminder for all of you, um, how do we go from an idea uh, to making something a therapeutic reality? Here are the steps that we would need in order to bring remyelination stem cell therapy to you and your loved ones. You have to do preclinical work uh, to develop whatever cell line you're interested in using. You have to test it to prove that it is safe because when I put a stem cell into your spinal cord or your brain, odds are you do not want it to grow into a tooth or a piece of liver or something like that. You want it to grow myelin. And so one of the things that has to be proven to the FDA is the cell we're using is only gonna do what we think it's gonna do and not go rogue and give you a tooth in the middle of your spinal cord. And then you get approval from the FDA called an IND, an Investigational New Drug Award, uh, uh, Allowance, to actually put it into a human for the first time. You cannot do a clinical trial in the United States uh, without an IND from the FDA. And then you move through the phases of trials. And so 
I won't belabor this point, it's just the reminder that if you take a, just an embryonic derived stem cell and put it in a dish and you come back later, you're gonna see a little bit of muscle, a little bit of heart, maybe a neuron, maybe a tooth. It just starts going into different things. We've known about that for over 50 years. The trick was, could we get the cells to just do what we wanted? And that was literally at least 40 years worth of work to go from a single cell and know it would just make an oligoprogenitor cell. So where do we stand relative to um, today? So uh, the preclinical work, you have animal models of demyelination. These cells that were created called glial-restricted precursor cells were transplanted into the animals and you assess for remyelination. And in the animals, they remyelinated. You can take the same uh, animal models and look for adverse events. So this was a long amount of work to show that the cells when transplanted, not only did they remyelinate, but they also didn't lead to any adverse events. So that data was used to put in an IND with the FDA. And the application requires a long list of things and uh, in order for them to approve going to humans. And within that IND, you have to tell them, how do you plan to study this in a human? So you have to design a phase one study. And as you've already asked, how do you, who should go into that study? How do you design it? There are a lot of questions. Do you take somebody in the acute setting six months out, 10 years out? Who do you include in that, in that uh, trial? Children, adults. How do you deliver the cells? I'd love to just have you swallow the cells and they go wherever they're supposed to do. Biology usually isn't that friendly to us. So you have to figure out a way to get the cells where you want them. How do you monitor for safety? How do you monitor for efficacy? How long should patients be followed? And then once you agree on all of that, the FDA gives you permission and you can do a phase one study. After you do that, you can move on to a phase two or three study. And once you do a phase two or three study, that's when you can get approval for a stem cell to be used in any of these conditions, and I reference transverse myelitis. So where are we as of today? So along this spectrum, I'm gonna check off the boxes for where we are. So when are we gonna to get to that endpoint? So we have completed the preclinical development for the cells. So there's a lot of work, and I'm, gonna go, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. I'm gonna to skip to this slide showing that um, you can take a certain cell line, uh, a human-derived cell line of glial-restricted precursor cells, and when you put them into animals, they remyelinate and they don't cause other issues. They didn't grow into a tooth and they didn't induce inflammation or tumors. So then you have to move towards preclinical testing in actual models. And what's shown here is uh, nervous system tissue from a mouse. There should be a fair amount of blue and in the middle, uh, there's none. On the right is when the stem cells were given. And so it's remyelinating those axons and growing it. And this genetic mutation of mouse, which is born without myelin or, or loses its myelin, I should say, is a uniformly fatal uh, genetic mutation of the mouse. Uh, but when you transplant these cells, the mice survive. Uh, they live because they're able to myelinate the central nervous system. Okay, so you've got preclinical testing and some data. Well, now you gotta go to the FDA. And so uh, we entered into an approach with the FDA at Southwestern uh, in collaboration with the company that has the cells called Q Therapeutics. Uh, and we were given, uh, granted the IND from the FDA last summer to proceed with a phase one trial in humans. So in order to go to a phase one trial uh, for humans, you need a couple things. Uh, you need an IRB approval. Uh, we've achieved our IRB approval at UT Southwestern. And then in order to get the cells in, this is a direct transplant into spinal cords, a direct injection into spinal cords. And there's a device that's used to do it. There's only a couple centers that have been using the device. And so you have to have your surgeon trained on the device. And our surgeon last week uh, finished the first part of two parts of his training down in Atlanta uh, for using the device. But all that's great. You can have the best plan, you can have the best uh, uh, protocol and your IND. Uh, but somebody has to fund the study. So funding a phase one trial, uh, we're happy to announce uh, that a, a donor at Southwestern put together the first 1.5 million, uh, which is what the phase one will cost for UT costs. Uh, and that has been secured. So we've been given the green light uh, to move forward with the trial. Uh, one of the things that's happened is the TMA 
uh, has stepped in to raise funds, and this is part of the Eclipse Fund, to cover a lot of costs as part of a trial that happen outside of the walls of UT. And so as you're reading about the Eclipse Fund, uh, know that a, a significant proportion of that is dedicated to making sure this trial is a success and that families who don't live in the Metroplex area can get to the Metroplex area if they want to take part. We expect to begin enrollment in the next several months. Um, this is going to be an adult trial. It's a phase one safety trial. It will be nine adults uh, who are non-ambulatory, and they can be anywhere from one to ten years out from their event. Those are the general kind of guidelines of who the first nine are going to be. And as we assess the safety data from this trial, we will very rapidly decide about moving into other uh, groups and other timelines. Uh, the Transverse Myelitis Association will be giving regular updates on their website in terms of how to be in contact with us if you're interested and where we'll go. But um, the idea here is the age of doing a remyelination trial is finally here. Uh, we'll start getting the first patients in as we're into 2019. So uh, you've seen the slide relative uh, uh, to this and the much prettier slide, which are these two. Um, but we're excited for this. And during the question and answer session, we're happy to take any questions you have. Thank you.